Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, if you go to lesson one, page five, where we, we left off last time on page five, because last week we had our singing, scripture reading, uh, a lot of song practice, and it was great. And uh, But as we're looking in this first lesson, and uh, we've already gone over this one side, we get this. Uh, the Bible can be understood, the expectations. We've looked at these passages on the left-hand side, and that was on page four, where you even filled in, and we talked about expectations from those passages. In other words, what is the ex expectation of the Word of God? And we're talking about understandability, the ability to comprehend Scripture. And we're going to be looking in a couple of moments at promises. So when you go to chapter, excuse me, go to page five, and when we speak about Bible study and looking at the text itself per se, this brings us to a topic that I'm just kind of cracking the ice with it right now. But we're going to be we're going to be delving more into it as we get deeper into the class. But when we talk about type of criticism, textual criticism, biblical criticism, how important that is, criticism. When you look at it, it says criticism is one method used to ascertain the truth of the written word. Scholars classify biblical criticism into major divisions of higher criticism and lower criticism. These are subdivided as follows. I think a lot of you probably remember Bible classes even from years ago, how the Bible is divided up in you know, books, of, books of law, books of history, books of, of poetry, book of prophecy. We've all seen those kinds of studies before, or those categories, right? And in the New Testament, uh, the, the, the Gospels you have, and Acts is, is, a, is a book of history, and then all the epistles, but usually the Pauline epistles, Paul's epistles, and then there's the general epistles. And then, of course, then the Apocalypse or the book of Revelation. And, and so a lot of times it will, will place these books in categories because of the material or the kind of information that is contained within it. Now, when we're talking about criticism here, higher criticism, lower criticism, we always have to take into consideration uh, things about a literary style and so forth. And the very first thing that you see there, it says, Literary criticism, a kind of higher criticism concerning the study of books as literary uh, documents. The study considers such questions as who wrote it, why did the author write the book in its present form, to whom is it addressed, under what circumstances was it written, from what time does it come, what sources, if any, did the author use. Most of you have been or are in the Sunday morning class. And when we, we've been going through all the books of the New Testament, and we always have an introduction. And in the literary criticism, in other words, is we're looking at this as a piece of literature. Because it is. Though it's from God and it's inspired literature, notwithstanding, it is literature. And we, we want to know such things as, as authorship and audience and date and historical circumstances and so forth. Because this will help us to understand not just the meaning of the book, which is very, very important, but in understanding the meaning of the book, Many times we have to consider what is the historical setting and, and how that fits into the message that is given at, at the time. And so I think we just kind of understand that. Those are common sense things. Uh, we are on, uh, we're on page five of lesson one for those that just came in on the last couple of, of moments. Is there anybody else that needs a copy of lesson one tonight? Are we good back there? I think we're good. Okay, great. Now, so on page five, now form criticism, method of higher criticism, that supposes that literature had an oral form centuries before it was committed to writing. The method requires a study of the text prehistory to determine its different literary categories and each category's peculiar life situation. It emphasizes uh, the presupposition. Uh, for example, a, each gospel in our present manuscripts it is not a single creation out of a whole, but a collection of materials the final selections and arrangements owing to the evangelist himself. So when we look and we understand we have four Gospels, for example, in the New Testament that, have been, that are in the canon of Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we understand that as they put these together, uh, Luke, for example, think about Luke. We know that Luke was, was, was not an apostle. In fact, what was Luke? 
Yeah, he was a physician. And we also know that Luke was not a first generation Christian. You, you understand that from chapter 1, the first several verses. And he, he is going to write of things that he, was, that he has heard and was told. And yet, is there, is there inspiration? Indeed, that there is. But what he's going to do, even those things that he had been taught, and those things that, as he says, which were most surely believed, Remember, he's writing this as a treatise. And who does he write it to? Theophilus, a Greek nobleman. And so he takes these things and he puts it in, in an order. He puts it in an order, these things that are most surely believed. And so he takes the life of Christ and, and he puts it in this particular order. Now, that's why there are some differences between Luke and, say, Matthew and Mark. Certainly the differences between Luke and the Gospel of John. Uh, Luke then not only where he leaves off in his orderly fashion of Luke 24, he's going to pick up and continue to write to Theophilus. And what book is that? The book of Acts. And so Luke, who wrote the book of the Gospel of Luke, where he leaves off in chapter 24, he picks up in Acts chapter 1. So we understand that. But so we know who the author is. We understand who the, the audience is that was written to a man uh, by the name of Theophilus. But now we understand that there are some things, that, that presuppositions that were there in reference to those things that he was taught, that he was taught, that he knew about. But God can use these men to write this down in an orderly fashion. So each gospel has a prehistory or oral transmissions. These are small oral tradition units that are classified as a pronouncement stories. It says miracle stories, sayings. The sayings are subdivided in words, uh, wisdom words, parables, myths, legends, when you look at literature as a whole. The Bible, for example, the Gospels is filled with parables. Does, but does Luke have all of the parables? No. Matthew doesn't have all the parables. Mark doesn't have all the parables. But the collection of parables that we have between Matthew, Mark, and Luke gives us the composite of what we have in Jesus doing. Well, in this criticism, form of criticism, we're, we're looking at this, and, and the writers are giving us the big picture, of, of course, of who Jesus is and what his ministry, what his ministry was. And so um, whenever you're talking about criticism, you have to get down to, again, the writers and the purposes and, and those kinds of, um, uh, of intentions. Three, content and criticism. A kind of higher criticism that involves criticism of the theological content of a book. For example, scholars will evaluate a book in terms of whether or not it teaches the doctrine of, for example, justification by faith. Others will evaluate a writing in the light of what they believe the situation should have demanded. It also passes on which books should be considered as canonical. This kind of criticism is a basis for our study. So again, when we're, when we're talking about type of criticism, we're talking about all literature extant. Anytime that we're dealing with ancient, ancient books. We could be talking about the writing of Homer. And Homer, who predates the birth of Jesus by a few centuries. There's a criticism. There's various forms of literary criticism, form criticism that are given to determine the authenticity, the legitimacy of, of those books. For example, in the writings of Homer, we're not talking about biblical writings. We're not even talking about religious writings. But do we believe that there was an individual by the name of Homer? Do we believe that he wrote certain books like the, the Iliad and the Odyssey and so forth? And did you, all, did you all know that we have no original autographs of his books whatsoever? We have copies of copies. Jason? Most of his stories were oral. And there's the point. And so it is even now believed that what was started off as an oral type of history, or if he's writing even fiction as he would do, that in later in time, then that oral was taken and, and written down. And so there are some that now even question if he wrote, if he actually wrote anything. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? And so whenever you're looking at books of antiquity, but now when we look at the Gospels, or we look at the New Testament or any of the Bible, we understand that there were oral, there were there were oral messages, oral stories. Think about the history of the, of, of the children of Israel. Now they had the law, they had the book of the law, but do you think that everybody had a copy of, of the books of the kings, the book of the Chronicles? Well, no. I mean, historically they did not. 
But what did those, did those families orally hand down those stories about Saul and David and Solomon? Yes. But what's fascinating about this is the discovery of these actual books like the Kings and the Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, the books of the Kings of the Old Testament, as those were discovered, you know, it's very fascinating is that the written history is in agreement with what most of the oral tradition, traditional stories were told anyway. But when this comes back down to content criticism, that when you're looking at these books, you know, if you have something that's written and found in some literature, something that's very old, but yet you find out that it is drastically different than either what has always been orally told before that or in other books that might even be older than it, then you might begin to then criticize or question the validity of that particular book. I just want us to understand that when you're dealing with, with textual criticism, it is a huge, huge body of work. And it's, 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 it's something that is beyond than just understanding, uh, translating uh, language. It's understanding uh, what is, how legitimate is this. Uh, for example, as we'll see later, what made the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls so important? Well, several things did. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the late 1940s, they found these documents that were known to be over 2,100 years old. Did that help to formulate, inform criticism, did that, that help to formulate authenticity to the Old Testament that we had had for centuries? You see, now, just suppose that all of a sudden there are major differences in those ancient, ancient scrolls, manuscripts, because they were much older than anything that we had had up to that day. Can you imagine the, what the critics and the skeptics of the Bible would have done that upon getting the Dead Sea Scrolls, finding out that it was drastically different with those more ancient, or if you will, documents said than what we had in the Bible, what do you think people would have been concluding about the Bible? They would have been saying, you know what, the Bible is not authentic, it's not legitimate, it cannot be trusted. But that's not what happened. It's the opposite happened. It absolutely legitimized or confirmed and what these old, but again, this takes us to textual criticism. Criticizing the text, even to see if something belongs in the text. We have, you know what, do we have, for example, take any translation of the Bible, but take the King James translation. And the King James translation is a good translation based on the received text, the Texas Receptus. But I'll ask, you know, Dennis uses the, the King James. Can you think of like any one word that's in the King James Version that when you apply textual criticism that doesn't belong there, Dennis? Like a word that was put in the King James Version that has no justification when you apply textual criticism. Like Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. Easter. Easter. Yeah. Right, because the Greek word there is Pascha, it's Passover, right? But here in 1611, and even before in the commissioning of the King James Version, their King James, he there commanded that that would be inserted. And so we involve ourselves in some textual criticism and we're able to say, you want to know something? Easter doesn't belong in there, does it? Now, should we throw the whole King James Version away? Uh, evidently, you don't think so, Dennis. <laughs> right? First uh, John 5, 7 is spurious. The ancient man has no business in there. There are three that bear witness in heaven. That, you know, as far as the water, the, the, the water, the word, let's see, the Holy Spirit, these three are one. Spurious. It has no business being in there. That's like a lot of your a lot of your translations, you'll have a marginal note. It'll say, and, and if you read the New American Standard, the NIV, the ESV, a lot of times they'll put a marginal note because it's spurious. It shouldn't be in there. Are we going to throw the whole Bible away? Of course not. Okay. But here's the value of textual criticism again. This is hugely important. Okay. That's why when new translations come up, do we have the ability? Because of what's available. That's what we mean by extent, right? What is there? What is available? What's been discovered and found? Are we able to determine if something's a good or bad trend? We really are. Because of the multiplicity of the documents and the fragments and the manuscripts, the codices that exist. Okay, we've got to move on.
So in the last one, textual criticism, which I've been touching upon, a kind of lower criticism, when, when as far as it is principally concerned with the investigation of the changes introduced during hand copying and recopying of a document. Do you think that in a lot of the manuscripts that were copied and copied and recopied and recopied, do you think that some of those scribes ever made any mistakes in the copying and the recopying and the recopying, especially things like numbers? Yeah, we, we've, we've seen that. There'll be some discrepancies there. And so in this criticism, we look at this and we say, okay, you have to go with preponderance of evidence then. And that when we look and say, well, X amount of manuscripts, what are the oldest one, or what is the multiplicity of them say, that the majority of them say, and I mean, uh, Tim had to deal with that not long ago in 2 Samuel, I think it was, in reference to 70 versus 700, because in the Hebrew, it looks very, very similar. I was telling somebody that the situation, a lot of you have heard this story before, you know, there have been a lot of monasteries through the years, through the last several centuries. There were monks, you know what they did? They did scribal work. They, they meticulously, copiously, they were writing, 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 writing biblical literature. Sometimes the biblical text itself. And that's what they did. Wasn't it the old Xerox commercials that I think, way back in the 70s, that it showed the monk sitting down there? I think it was, you know, because that's what they did. But I love the story that there was a, a monk and he was brand new at the job at this monastery of being a scribe, writing these all down. And he was just all excited because he's new and, and, and so forth. And the other guys have been doing it for years and they're just kind of doing their everyday work. But man, he goes down to the recesses of the monastery and he finds these documents, these manuscripts that were dusty and nobody had laid their eyes on forever. And he comes up with this one. He goes, oh, brothers, brothers. It says, celebrate, celebrate, not celibate, celibate. <laughs> Oops, just a little mistake. The, well, the point that I'm trying to make is that we got to understand that with the multiplicity of reproductions, are there going to be some textual errors, scribal errors? Yes, there are. But here's what's beautiful about the biblical documents, is that we have so many of the manuscripts available, literally thousands of the New Testament alone. Over 5,000. Not to mention Old Testament Dead Sea Scrolls and then other scrolls that have been in existence for a long, long time. And so this becomes very, very important to these various forms of, of how we, how you historically, literary, in a literary way, how you're going to criticize and try to determine legitimacy, canonicity. We talk about the canon of Scripture, and I had asked somebody today earlier, how, how many of you have actually heard of that, that expression? I think most or all of you probably have. The, the, canon, the canon, the scripture canon, right? And, and, and does anybody know what the word canon is a Greek word? It's a Greek, it's a Greek word. It's, it would be a, a kappa, alpha, noon, omicron, noon. Canon. Kind of with a K instead of a C, although when we, when we translate in English, we use a C, don't we? Canon. Anybody know what that Greek word canon means? Rule. It's where we get our word ruler. Because the idea of canon is to walk by a rule. The Apostle Paul uses it a handful of times in his epistles by the rule of which we are to walk. And so when they talk about the canon, because there was a criticism applied that was going to be a rule, a rule that was used to determine, hopefully, inspiration and so forth. Okay, now... I'd ask you to look up a couple of words, the, the material asks you to look up a couple of words at the bottom of page five uh, when it comes to definition. So, obviously, what do we mean by interpret and interpret and interpretation? What, what, okay, Dennis, please, yes. I want people to speak up here so I don't have to just call on you cold turkey. To explain the meaning of something. Yeah, explain the meaning of something, to interpret. Uh, in fact, I have to explain the meaning of dot, 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 whatever we're talking about, right? Okay, so when we look at it then, to interpret is, is a verb, and interpretation or interpretations is a noun, singular or plural in this case, and so the interpretation is what? It's, it, it is the result of that which has been interpreted, of course, but so we, we understand, because how many times have people said, you've talked with people and say, when it comes to the Bible and say, well, that's your interpretation. And we all, we've all been there, right? Well, that's your interpretation. That is a fair statement. But we have to interpret communication every day, do we not? I've been talking here for several minutes. 
I'm asking you to, to, to listen and then to interpret, to try to understand, to interpret. When we communicate with one another, there is, there are, there, there is an intention to interpret, to, to give forth a message, to receive that message, to understand, to comprehend, and then to, in many times, you have to do something with that message, all right? And so that's just kind of a communicative model any, any way. And so there's always interpretation. But when we look at the Bible, so when we talk about interpreting the Bible, there are some things, that, that there are rules of interpretation. And, and, and uh, I'm writing a, a paper on it right now, a major paper in a presentation I'll be giving on, on the fallacy of proof text. We find proof texting all the time. We ourselves are guilty of proof texting too much. What do I mean by proof texting? There are several types of proof texting, but what's kind of the, the generic idea of, of to proof text? What do you think, Vance? Using text to sort of prove a personal opinion or to have presupp like presuppose about the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, and there is kind of a presupposition there. And so, and Annette, were you going to say something? Yeah, it's, it's not looking at the context, but ah. looking here and there to prove a point. Right. Kind of cherry picking, isn't it? And the idea that is, and that we might that we might take a scripture and and just take that scripture out of its context because we kind of like the wording of it, and now we're going to make this say what we want it to mean and say. Is that is there a danger in doing that all the time? Okay, I'm writing a paper on this, dealing with it with about a dozen different types of, of proof texting fallacies or errors. What do we mean by hermeneutics? That's one of those two-bit theological words we find from time to time. But what is, who, who has an answer down there for kind of a definition for hermeneutics? Hoyt? The science of interpretation, especially scripture. Say that now again, but loud. The science of interpretation, especially the scripture. Yeah, so especially when we're talking about biblical interpretation. So that's why we first look at interpretation. And then, but it's the science of interpretation. And Tim? I was going to say, um, as Peter wrote, there, there is no private interpretation or, or own personal one. If you use that method, we're going to come to a common understanding, most likely. If we do it the right way and with the um, right heart and looking at it honestly, uh, that's going to help us all come to a common understanding. Very good. You know, when you talk about then, then uh, interpretation and, and personal or private interpretation, a lot of times because there's an agenda, isn't there? There might be an agenda. And so this really, to, to, it's, we're all talking about methodology here. What's the methodology that's being used? For example, many of you have heard through years that, well, there needs to be, in order to authorize something as being true or biblical before God, there has to be at least one of these three. How many of you have heard of this? Express statement or commandment, apostolic example or precedent, and necessary inference or conclusion. All of us have heard that before. Understand that that's a hermeneutic. That's a, methodologi a methodological approach to interpretation called hermeneutics. Uh, hermeneutics, uh, evidently coming from Hermes, because when you look at Hermes, the Greek God in Greek mythology, whose counterpart in Rome and Roman mythology was Mercury. Mercury or Hermes mythologically had what on their feet? Wings. Wings. Because they were the what kind of gods? Messenger. The messenger gods. In other words, they took the so-called messages of either of either Zeus or Jupiter and then delivered that message. They had to deliver this message to the audience that was intended. And, and so when Paul and Barnabas on their travels came to that city and they called Paul Hermes because he was the what? The chief speaker. Remember it says that he was the chief speaker. And so hermeneutics has to deal with delivering a message. But in the delivery of that message, it's a methodology that is applied to how it's understood. Um, Hoyt said something interesting in that definition. Hoyt, and again, did you say the science of? Well, let me turn back. Look at that again. The science 
to give any meaning to uh, the science of interpretation, especially the scripture. And the reason why they say science is because there are rules. I want you to think about it, that because even in our grammar and our language, are there rules? Mm -hmm. There are rules of grammar. And, and so it's science because there are hard, fast rules that are employed, and you have to have that in order for language to be consistent, to be understandable, but particularly to be consistent so that we can understand what that communication means. If you don't apply the rules and there are no rules, then people could say anything and say, well, that's not what I meant. Okay, but it's also an art form. And the reason why it's also that hermeneutics involves some art as well as science, because not every, because we have, then we have such things as literary style, we have metaphors, we have similes, we have figurative speech, we have symbolic speech, and that becomes more of an art form. And do we even see that in the biblical literature as well? Oh, absolutely. So it's a very interesting field, and the field of hermeneutics has several subcategories to it as well. How to establish authority, for example. Linguistic studies, and we could go on and on. Go to the next page. Now, these four scriptures that I have here, the promise of the Bible can be understood. And as it says, these in the New Testament tell about promises that cannot be obtained without gaining knowledge or without knowing something. It's the how, how, how imperative. Uh, this one is referred to as the great invitation of Jesus. So let's, have, I want just people ready to go to these. Is there anybody already that can read for, for me? Okay, great, Annette. Matthew 11, the invitation of Jesus, 28 through 30. Nice and loud, that. okay? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. Now when you look at that, there are a couple of expectations. There are some promises there, some wonderful promises. But when you looked at that, what was a real stated expectation that Jesus expected of those to whom he was speaking? What was the expectation? Yeah. Come, in fact, come what? Learn, right? Now he talks about take my, you know, take this yoke and so but come learn from me. There was the expectation of learning. Jesus, here's the scripture, but you've got to have this expectation of learning. Okay? But to learn something, there has to be knowledge. That's why we need to become more and more biblically literate. Know the scripture. Know the Bible. Know how to be involved in the criticisms. To know, is it a is it history? Is it poetry? Is it prophecy? Is it an epistle, a letter? All those things become very important to understand the intentionality of the scripture, okay? Uh, who has 1 John 5.20? One verse there. Clint, go ahead. 1 John 5.20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. By the way, we're going to go to the next one in a minute. It says first, but that should be second Timothy, not first Timothy. I apologize for that. But now let's go back to first John. What's the expectation there that Clint just read? What's the expectation? Uh, go ahead. Uh, what's that, Jessica? Understanding. And he even says in the translation, did to know, but understanding is what I have written on mine. The expectation was understanding. Scripture was intended to be given to be understood, okay? Now, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, a whole lot of you could quote that. But who wants to quote it or read it? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Who's got it? Who's ready to go? Somebody, who's going? Okay, Betsy, thank you. So what's the expectation there? What do you think? That's kind of a tricky one, but I mean, I think it's, it's evident. But what seems to be the expectation? What's that? That we're thoroughly equipped. Yeah, to be thoroughly equipped. The expectation is that if we know those scriptures, 
Or we're going to be thoroughly equipped, and thoroughly equipped to do for what? For every for every good work. And by the way, if it's a good work in the eyes of God, then it can be substantiated by Scripture, right? But the expectation, because it's going to be profitable here, here, and here, but the expectation is that you learn, you know God's Word, you'll be equipped and ready for every good work. And finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 6 through 7. Uh, Hoyt, go ahead. Thank you. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written, then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Now, what's the expectation that, that Paul speaks of there? And he uses himself and Paul as, an exam as examples. But what's the expectation there? What do you think? Well, I think, first of all, it is certainly that. That you may learn, even as Paul and Paulus had to abide by the same rule or canon, not to go beyond what is written, right? Which, again, takes us to the written word, because that's how God's word was given forth, was in written form. Do you see any other expectations there? Yeah, okay. So that, that there's always this thing that is that we stick with the scripture, don't go beyond what's written. But you know what? That even in our knowledge, because is it, can knowledge, can knowledge, Paul dealt with this, can knowledge puff up? And Paul warned them about that. And so the expectation is that you don't go beyond what's written. And the reason why we are to remain humble, because you know what? It's not the word of Brent, and it's not the word of you. It's the word of God. You see what I'm saying? Now, there's a, a degree of subjectivity of how you want to write out those, those particular uh, or... or, or, or illustrate the expectations, but I think we're all getting the point with that. When you look at this last section, and this takes us to kind of an interesting thing here, in divine revelation. Uh, what is meant by divine revelation? In Job 32, 8, and we've already seen the second, uh, Timothy 3, 16, and that should be 17, there's another mistake. If you have verse 18, uh, there, then, then we're going to involve some textual criticism right now. There is no verse 18, but 16 and 17. But who's got... Go to Job 3, just short little, short little verse. Job chapter 32, verse 8. Whoever's got it, just read it, even if you've read already. Job 32 and verse 8. Who's fast in the, in the heart? It, okay, Matt, go ahead. But it is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Now, it's very interesting, because I want to show you some things here, as we're going to be looking at Job 32. We already looked at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That all scripture is given by what? Inspiration. The inspiration. You may have a translation that says that all scripture is what? God breathed. God breathed as opposed to inspiration. And we have a couple of works, words here that are interesting. So I have beneath, beneath Job 32.8 is the Hebrew word because Job, original Job would be in Hebrew. And that's the word ruach. Great, very interesting article in um, in um, the um, uh, think of it in the Wall Street Journal just earlier this week. In fact, I cut it out and made some copies of it because it is a a Hebrew teacher at a major university that has recently read a very very new modern translation of the Bible that basically has taken spirit out of the Old Testament, and she talks about. Ruach a lot, and when and Sam has learned, for example, a lot about about a ruach and and, and and the whole idea and its equivalent in the Greek that we have pneuma because that means spirit. But both of these words, ruach and pneuma, can mean what? Breath, wind. We've talked about in our teaching night class last night the Barkas is is we're talking about the Holy Spirit. So the spirit of man. But God's breath, God's spirit has come upon man. You just read that in Job 32. 
And that's, that's, they understood that. That, you know, first of all, think about the breath of God is life-giving, is it not? The, the breath of God. What's Genesis 2, 7 say? That the Lord God formed man from what? Dust of the ground of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So breathe, Ruach, into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life and man became a living soul. Well, that concept, because that's why we have, when we're talking about the breath of God, it is life producing. So the Apostle Paul uses a word that is found only one time of all Grecian literature that we have extant, as far as ancient Grecian literature. And that's in 2 Timothy 3.16 in Theonustus. Now obviously, Thea, Theos, would be what word in Greek? God. And Nustus is going to be coming from Numa. Literally, it means God breathed. That's why some translations said, for all scripture is God breathed. But we say inspiration because inspiration suggests life. It's life giving. What's the opposite of inspiration? It would be ex. So the out, we don't have a word outspiration, but we do have a word expiration. And an expiration, if something expires, if somebody expires, that means that they have, they've died. That's, that's death. And so what I want us to see in, in, these, in these verses, and uh, we'll have to get to this next week. You're going to be looking at that in Godhead. But go to this in general revelation. And here's what I want you to be thinking about is you're going to be studying Romans 1. But in general revelation is what we know about God based upon nature. Paul makes that point. Human processes are intuition. Romans 1, so that by nature they should have known even the very Godhead, the nature of God in a certain degree, and they're without excuse. And so I want you to look at that, and when you're studying that, I want you to pay close attention to verse number 20, because in verse 20, he's going to employ a Greek word, theates, theates, divine nature, Godhead, some translations will say, We'll see a very similar word to that in Colossians 2.9 uh, as we have theotes, theotes, in, in deity, but in Christ Jesus dwells the fullness of the theotes, Godhead, bodily. So we're going to look at that as well. And then we're going to see that in Hebrews 1 that Jesus Christ is the exact representation of God's nature, New American Standard said, the express image of his person, New King James Version, what we want to do is we want to make a correlation between deity, God, and the revelation and why it's divine revelation. And so we're going to transition as we go from this slide and this last material, because then that takes us right to, check, to lesson two, inspiration of the Bible. We want to now really deal with inspiration and writing material of the Bible. We'll start looking at now some of the interesting things about, about the writing materials and, and so forth. We have a lot to cover in that. Okay, we're out of time. In fact, we're a minute or two past. I know Donnie's knocked on the doors. Does anybody have any final thoughts or comments or questions that they wanted to give? So David. When, so when the acceptance of a book as it, as it goes through this criteria, are there occasions when the Absolutely. And I'm going to give you examples. And in the material, you're going to actually have some charts that will show why there were some that it took X amount of years later before it was really embraced as the canon of the Scripture. Now, some of them, there were reasons for that. And that was because sometimes was because of preconceived ideas and doctrinal prejudice. Guess what book that would be in the New Testament? James. Well, Mark 16, what's happened there in the translations of Mark 16 verses 9 through 20, because of the three codices of the Alexandrinus, the Sinaiticus, and the Vaticanus, they're, they're one of those, it's omitted, and so some of them have, have left it out or put a, a wide margin between and say the most ancient manuscripts do not contain this. You know what they don't tell you? The same manuscript that does not have Mark 6, 16, 9 through 20 does not have the most of Hebrews and doesn't even have the book of, of Revelation. But they don't say a word about that. 
That's showing some bias already. Does that make sense? We'll have, we'll have more to say about that as we go on, I'll tell you. Thank you very, very much, everybody.